remember a moment when you were at your happiest. There's a good chance you're thinking about a memory spent with friends, with loved ones. Or perhaps it's a workplace memory when you and your favorite colleague just burst into laughter for no reason and could not stop. Or maybe you're a teacher and your heart just overrun with pride and joy when your favorite student finally passed the exam. Or maybe you are, like I was in the past, a healthcare professional, and you finally found the right treatment for your patient. Thinking about my own life, and I've got many memories to choose from, it's a memory when there's music involved. I'm at a rock show, all my friends are there, my favorite band is playing, and my favorite band is playing that song I was so hoping they would play. Euphoria. In that instant, there is no outside world. There is no stress. There are no problems. There's just here, right now, this moment. An experience that's impossible to achieve by listening to a song on Spotify or watching a video on YouTube. No, these are all moments shared with people. And certainly not with a screen, because it's that feeling of being connected and being truly present. I think we could all use more of that in our own lives. Listen to my story. A few years ago, I had an appointment with my family doctor. There was no avoiding it. What had happened to me could not be resolved without outside help. During a night out in Paris, I was at a rock show with three buddies. I looked death in the face. A terrorist attack took place. Three attackers emptied their automatic weapons on me and my fellow concert goers. So I'm sitting here at my doctor's office. I know I need something. I don't know what. My family doctor, visibly impressed by the patient in front of her, whose story is dominating the global news at the time, she's very honest with me. She says, what you have been through is so unique and so extraordinary that at this time, I am not entirely sure what you do need. But we will figure this out together. And she hands me a prescription for Xanax, hence the long waiting list in mental health care. As I make my way towards the door, she scribbles something on a piece of paper. Here, my private number. You can always call me. As a healthcare professional that I was at the time, tears welled up in my eyes. I mean, a family doctor giving out her private number to every patient? That's just not feasible. But she found this situation to be so unique, so extraordinary, that she did what I think the professors back at the university had told her probably to never to do so, but what she felt in her heart was right. She followed her moral compass. Later that week, I had a similar experience. I had to report the terrorist attack I had survived at the police station in the city where I live. It was just awful. I had to recount the whole experience. It was as if I were reliving the whole trauma, the whole night. The police officer taking my statement, he noticed I wasn't doing well. I think he saw I was holding back my tears. So he interrupted me. He, he was like, are you okay? It seems like you need a hug. And before I had time to answer his question, he had already put his arms around me. I cried a little, and I saw his eyes turn watery too. From then on, my statement just came naturally, as if I was talking to a family member or a close friend. It showed the human side of professionals that goes beyond protocols and guidelines. It's a testament to their dedication, devotion, and empathy that sometimes hard to show for them when they found themselves snowed in by paperwork. And believe me, as a former physical therapist, I know. I was fortunate enough to experience that same kind of dedication from total strangers. The night of the attack, a Parisian family took me into their home. They offered me shelter, gave me some clean clothes, something to eat, and a hug when I needed one. And boy, did I. Now, I'm sure these Parisians don't just welcome any stranger into their homes. And at the time, I must admit, fairly Dutch, a drunk Dutch person, 
I certainly hope not. But they found this situation to be so unique and so extraordinary that they decided to open up their door and their hearts to me. And the funny thing is, by doing so, they invited me to do the same as I opened my door and my heart to the father of one of the Badaklan attackers. I was so happy he was willing to talk to me. And for me, it, it, it humanized the whole event. It gave me a perspective that is so rarely given in situations like these, which is the human side of the story. Well, my talk today isn't about the Badaklan attack in Paris. No, it's about something completely else. Because when we strip down all these examples down to their course, what do we have left? It's honest, sincere, human connection. But why is it? Why is it that those connections are so good for us? Well, a lot happens in your brain during social interaction. When you look someone directly into their eyes, share a hug together. With pleasantly perceived social interactions, your stress level can be reduced. You will feel connected and experience feelings of happiness. Hormones are released to make sure that you connect with one another. But most importantly, physical and emotional pain can be nurtured. And it is because of my family doctor, the law enforcement officer, and of the Parisian family, all these boxes were checked. I could go on and on on how I've dealt with this big trauma, of course, my PTSD. I won't do that today, but writing, meditating, exercising, helped me all to become the old fairy again. However, there was a small fragment of my trauma I could not meditate or write away. And that fragment was slowly getting worse. I felt very anxious and stressed, especially in the morning, and just experienced an overall feeling of unhappiness. And I found out after a while that my own behavior was responsible for this. I'm curious, who else can relate to this? That feeling of stress and unhappiness in the morning. Yeah, I know many of you do. And maybe, just like me, you are unaware of the fact that your own behavior is partly responsible for this. Because didn't I just learn how important human contact is? So why was I losing myself in the technology that was depriving me from just that? I became addicted to a device that we all have that you can simply buy in the store without being warned about its harmful side effects. And that makes totally sense, because who on earth is going to buy a device that mentions... Uh, please notice, when you use this, you will experience reduce of happiness and euphoria, with a constant craving for more while not using it. Brain structures can undergo traumatic changes. You might even use it to cope with emotional pain and stress, creating a vicious cycle, a constant craving for dopamine shots. I'm not talking about crack, cocaine, I'm talking about our mobile phones. Because my mental space had been hijacked, hijacked by a technology that is evolving at a speed that is unheard of. And which also makes life pretty easy at times, because I'm totally lost without my Google Maps, never had a workout without my Spotify, can have a quick Zoom session with a client overseas, and also remotely can see how my family in France is doing. Here they are. But I had an average screen time of eight hours per day. I mean, that is just insane. I had become a digital junkie and felt very stressed and far from connected with the world. After watching a documentary about screen time addiction, I decided to remove for a couple of weeks all those apps screaming for my attention. And we all know what apps I'm talking about. So, off they were. All of them. <laughs> okay, this one as well. <laughs> I cannot even begin to explain what these simple precautions, what kind of effect they had on me. I felt more calm, more in the moment. All my residual symptoms that I linked to my trauma were gone. Now, I know some of you also, like me, spent half your waking day looking at a screen or looking at your phone. 
And this is worrying me, because you're depriving yourself of, re of real human contact. Alarming research has shown that the more time we spend online, the less life satisfaction we experience, which is also reflected in the change behavior of young people. Their well-being has declined since 2008, with rising levels of anxiety, depression, self-harm and suicide rates. While this is not all technology's fault, it has all been linked to the introduction of the smartphone. While we also are living now in an era where hybrid working is becoming the norm, so even more time is spent at home, alone, behind the screen. While research has also shown that when you work remote or from home, you will effectively get more work done, but interaction quality takes a big hit without face-to-face -face social interactions. You also feel less connected to the company, and you'll be more likely to switch jobs easier. I would just be a terrible employer, really. I would make everyone come to the workplace, just because I like it too much. That team unity, when your minds align, and you and your colleagues are trapped in this unbreakable bubble, I just love that. And that's impossible to achieve remotely. And honestly, I'm glad life works this way. That a screen can never replace what we have here today as well. You know, that feeling of being together in one room. I can feel the atmosphere, I can look into your eyes, I can read your emotions if I really try to. And I think that feeling of being truly connect is what we all need more in our lives, and we certainly shouldn't become even more isolated and estranged from one, one another. So don't worry, I'm not going to tell you all to come back to the office full time or that you can never look at your phone again. Certainly not. But what I am going to say is that social interaction, interactions make life worth it and makes your life richer. So a few personal suggestions from me today, Amsterdam. Are you working remotely and are you missing out the connection with the workplace? Consider spending an extra day at the office for that job satisfaction and it will strengthen your bond with the company as well. Let those minds align. Embrace that team unity. The second one is, I would like you all to delete all your social media for just two weeks. See what it does to you. If you feel more energized, like I did, then that's a sign you really need to change your social media behavior. Last but not least, please take some of that human connection to the workplace. The key to connect with your patient, with your client. How you do that, that's totally up to you. But let me give you one suggestion. Imagine that the person sitting in front of you is your partner, your brother, your child, someone you love, and there is your answer. Give that hug if you think someone needs it. Speaking of hugs, who doesn't like hugs, right? And change starts today. Please rise. You know what's coming. Okay, with consent, give the person next to you an honest, sincere, big hug. Now tell me, Amsterdam, that doesn't feel good. Thank you.